so um, thank you very much for coming to this seminar, special seminar on the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, my name is Aiki Harahan. I am Associate Professor at the University of Tokyo, and I serve for AKUNS and AKUNS uh, Liaison Office Tokyo. Um, today we have Mr. David Chikubaidze, um, the serving chef of the cabinet of the UN office in Geneva, to share his personal experience at the occasion of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, first, about the procedure, we are going to proceed with Mr. Yasushi Akashi to make opening remarks, followed by Mr. David Chikubaidze, I'm very sorry about the pronunciation, Chikubaidze, um, keynote speech. After that, we will have three panelists um, on the panel discussion. We then have a free discussion moderated by Professor Sukehiro Hasegawa. Okay, now uh, may I invite Mr. Yasushi Akashi, former UN Under Secretary General and Special Representative of the Secretary General for Cambodia and former Yugoslavia to give opening remarks. Mr. Yaka Yasushi Akashi, please. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all here. And particularly, uh, I'm uh, anxious to hear uh, remarks by my very good uh, friend, uh, David Chikbaiti. Uh, David uh, has been working at the United Nations for quite some time. And uh, uh, he was born and uh, was brought up in Georgia, its capital. Tbilisi. He now lives uh, in Geneva. Uh, he's married and uh, has a son. And uh, he also has three grandsons, I understand. And David uh, Chikubaize uh, lived, uh, of course, in the Soviet Union. He worked uh, under President Gorbachev as well as uh, President Yeltsin in the last days of the Soviet Union. And we are all very anxious to hear uh, his remarks based on his own actual experiences. Mr. Yasushi Akashi. Um, now, if I may invite Mr. David Chikubaiji, the serving chef of the cabinet of the UN office in Geneva, to give his talk entitled Present at the Closing, a personal insight into the last days of the Soviet Union. Uh, please, um, Mr. Chikubaiji. It's a great privilege and a, and a great honor, and uh, actually a, a very humbling uh, experience to see so many important people um, taking time out of their busy schedules to, um, <clears throat> uh, to join in to this discussion. Uh, and I'm very, very uh, grateful for the invitation to share my personal sort of reminiscences. Um, I will try not to uh, try your patience with long uh, discussions, but just to touch on uh, some issues. Uh, but I'd like to first thank uh, um, uh, the organizers, the uh, Academic Council of the UN System, the uh, Global Peace Building Association of Japan, and uh, particularly uh, uh, Professors Hasegawa and uh, Kiara Hunt. Um, but I all want to uh, extend special thanks and greetings to Mr. Yasushi Akashi, who is a, a, a legend in the UN. Um, and I have the privilege of uh, calling him my, my former boss and still one of my favorite bosses. And I'm very, very privileged and very, very honored that you would take uh, time to not only be present, but also to uh, introduce me and introduce actually the, in such a brilliant way, the, the, the periodicity of, of the UN. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to recognize somewhere out there in cyberspace is my former colleague and uh, friend and uh, next door roommate, Kazuhide Kuroda, uh, whom I haven't seen in a long time, but we worked together for many years on the 29th floor of the uh, Secretariat building and had offices uh, adjacent. Um, this is, of course, a, a good time to uh, remember or start remembering because uh, by uh, next December, it will be precisely 30 years since the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, finally collapsed. 
definitively because it was in the process of, of uh, collapsing for some years. Um, uh, and I want to stress, of course, uh, despite the fact that a person cannot uh, uh, you know, distance oneself from uh, his or her current functions, this was conceived as a reminiscence of that time and a, a very personal insights. And I hope you, uh, you won't be disappointed. Um, you know, to provide a succinct answer, what it felt like uh, to be uh, you know, in, the, in the epicenter of, uh, uh, of that particular event and to um, experience the last days of the Soviet Union, I can tell you very succinctly that uh, it was akin to standing on the deck of the Titanic. Um, and that feeling uh, grew as the time uh, uh, came closer to, to the, um, uh, the end of the year. Um, actually, uh, I don't know um, if you have, uh, some of you may have read the book back when it came out in 1995. The uh, last Soviet, the last American ambassador to the Soviet Union, Ambassador Jack uh, Matlock, wrote a book, which he called "The Autopsy on an Empire," and uh, there um, you know, we discussed this. I was very flattered when he um, asked my permission to use what I had casually told him over drinks uh, before a dinner in New York uh, of what I felt uh, on that day. Uh, when, when Gorbachev resigned. And so he, he used my narrative as a foil uh, to hang the rest of his uh, research on and to um, uh, distinguish it from his own feelings. And, uh, uh, what he uh, writes is that, uh, you know, I told him how I felt. I, mean, I knew what was coming. Uh, we were all... Uh, in this together. Um, however, when, when the resignation speech was made, uh, you know, it, it had finally happened. So I went down to my office and, uh, and uh, was, uh, I, I will get to those feelings. I don't want to run ahead of myself. Uh, but uh, what, one question that Ambassador Matlock asked himself and, uh, and one of the reasons why he decided to write this uh, very, very um, important and uh, detailed uh, memoir uh, was that he opposed himself to me. He said, unlike David Chikvaidze, um, I uh, uh, was a US, uh, an American ambassador and a specialist in Soviet affairs who had uh, uh, dedicated his life to working uh, basically against, uh, politically against this, uh, this country, uh, which uh, President Reagan, uh, at the beginning of uh, the 80s, called the evil empire. However, Ambassador Madlock says that when he finally heard of the uh, final closure of the country, he didn't feel uh, wanting, he didn't want to uh, uh, celebrate. And that is one of the issues that uh, prompted him to uh, research uh, this. And, and uh, one of the questions he asks, and he gives an implicit answer, was what was it that died on the 25th of December 1991? Was it the evil empire or was it uh, the, the embryo of a, of a new um, Soviet Union or some form of uh, that country, which actually uh, proved to be a good and, uh, um, and uh, constructive partner of the West. And uh, there were two historic uh, examples of, of this, uh, one of which uh, Mr. Akashi is a direct uh, participant. Um, it was the, uh, the vote on uh, uh, Security Council resolution creating uh, UNTAC, which uh, Mr. Akashi headed, and it was a resolution in February 1992, uh, hot after the uh, first ever uh, summit 
uh, meeting of the Security Council, which was in January 1992. And, um, and the other was uh, before that, the, uh, the vote in the Security Council, uh, where the Soviet Union uh, voted for, uh, was the uh, Desert Storm. Uh, and uh, due to uh, very deft diplomacy by James Baker, uh, also my former boss and also one of my favorite bosses, I don't have that many uh, favorite bosses. I mean, I have many past bosses. Um, uh, there were, uh, nobody voted against, and there were just two abstentions. So uh, th this was the, uh, the kind of, uh, partnership, if you will, that was evolving. So that's why Ambassador Madlock was, uh, was curious to explore this and, and uh, find answers to this. Um, I must say that um, my experience was very concentrated because I came back to Moscow a year and three months before the country collapsed. Uh, However, five months before, uh, sorry, five months after Gorbachev was uh, appointed as uh, general secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, I took up my first uh, diplomatic posting uh, as a junior diplomat in the Soviet embassy in Washington, which I uh, was really um, keen uh, to do uh, to try to catch uh, still Ambassador Dobrynin, the legendary Ambassador Dobrynin, who had spent 23 and a half years as Soviet Ambassador in Washington, which I did. Uh, he later left uh, about eight months after my arrival, and I continued on for five years, uh, coming back in uh, September 1990, which was six months after Gorbachev had been elected by the Supreme Soviet as president of the Soviet. Uh, and, and so the reason I'm remembering Washington is for two, uh, two main reasons. One is that it was and has remained uh, the most interesting and the most fulfilling and rewarding job that I've ever had. And I actually said as much when I was leaving Washington. I didn't know what would come later. I didn't know uh, I would work as my immediate um, job upon return, which was also very interesting. It was to join the, uh, the newly formed protocol and advance office of the administration of the president of the USSR. And when I got this uh, invitation, by then I had, I had had three uh, summit meetings behind my belt um, and uh, over two dozen various meetings, uh, foreign ministers, other government delegations, and so, because uh, I was also part of my job was uh, chief of protocol of the embassy. I was special assistant to the ambassador. So when I got this proposal, I thought, wow, I know the White House inside out, White House, Red House. And uh, so I took the job. I was seconded from the foreign ministry. And, uh, you know, during these five years in Washington, we were a little bit scared uh, of the immediate feeling that something was very, very wrong. We obviously watched all this, we, we uh, listened, we read about uh, things going back home, the word coming back and forth. And um, however, it wasn't as acute. Um, and also the atmosphere, the Soviet American atmosphere back then was so friendly. It was such a blossoming of relations. It was, a, I, I would even say a rough test. We were, rediscovering or discovering many aspects about each other. And, uh, and so we were busy. We were busy doing good work with our American uh, counterparts whom we did not consider as adversaries. We considered ourselves to be on the same team doing the same job. And very often when we had, um, uh, we had some, you know, one side or the other had a problem or a snafu happened, we would, uh, uh, extend a helping hand and, and bail each other out. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it still remains as a height, I think, of, of collaboration and of good relations. Um, I should say that, you know, my larger family-wise, um, my father at the time was uh, Soviet ambassador in, in Holland. And uh, he too, obviously, as ambassador, he had 
um, many more sort of sources of information, but he too and my mom were kind of uh, saved the immediate brunt of all this. Uh, the only person who was uh, on the receiving end of much of this was my uh, younger brother, now deceased, uh, who was in Tbilisi and lived through uh, April 1989 and many other um, convulsions of, of that period. Um, upon return, uh, I took up this job with gusto, and uh, I must say that the job was extremely interesting, and if for no other reason, it was absolutely, uh, you know, it has remained uh, very, very vivid in my mind that it, this was the job that um, gave me the experience of preparing the first ever state visit by the president of the USSR to Japan. And I was in charge on the protocol side of this visit in April 1991. And it was a, uh, a very challenging visit, uh, challenging because of, uh, of our Side's uh, inability to uh, keep to a, an agreed um, schedule and, and uh, draft program. We kept changing things on our Japanese colleagues, much to their consternation. Uh, but we finally achieved everything, and it was a very, very uh, successful visit. Uh, and uh, for me, it was a visit of great um, personal satisfaction. Um, but things were, uh, you know, it's a, it's a strange uh, thing I'm gonna uh, say, but, um, you know, I noticed one thing when I came back to Moscow, um, traffic. And uh, the reason I'm saying this is because I come from Georgia. In Georgia, we never watch traffic lights, we never change lanes uh, using our turn signals. But in Moscow, it was very, very, regimented, everybody uh, obeyed the traffic laws, etc. When I came back in uh, the end of 1990, the first thing I noticed was people were running red lights in Moscow. Traffic was uh, more similar to what was happening in Georgia. And my first thought was, why is this happening? Was there something uh, wrong deeper than just traffic patterns? As it turned out, it was, it was true. Um, but beyond that, there were uh, Life was unsettled. Uh, you see, what happened was that President Gorbachev uh, put forward two policy uh, issues. One was Glasnost, and the other was Perestroika. Glasnost uh, has been translated differently. What it means basically uh, is um, uh, voicing your thoughts, concerns. Uh, and perestroika means reconstruction, restructuring. And what it meant was the economy. And what we wound up with, since restarting or restructuring the economy is much uh, more difficult, uh, the economy, the restructuring, the perestroika part never took off for a variety of reasons, which is not the point of this discussion. It never took off. Whereas Galasnos took off like a prairie fire. So we wound up with, uh, what was it then, 330 million or something uh, people of the Soviet Union speaking their mind and airing their concerns on an empty stomach, which was, uh, which was a recipe for disaster. Um, and there are many, many uh, concomitant uh, issues there. I don't want to go into all of them. They are part of the public record. There are many uh, books, memoirs, monographs, and they will be in yet many more. But one thing is clear, that by the time that well, I got back to, to Moscow, and by the time that it was less than a year and a half left in the life of the Soviet Union, the, uh, the, the, the there, were, there was no longer a constituency left that had a stake in the survival of the country. One would assume that um, the, um, um, the, the bureaucracy, the party uh, apparatus would have been such a constituency, but they ran out of intellectual steam long before, a few years before. Um, there was nothing uh, original that the party ideologues had managed to come up with. They kept uh, 
reciting Lenin's works, which were mostly polemical and uh, having to do with, uh, with the time, uh, 70 years time, a totally different uh, historical and uh, political situation. So even that constituency uh, didn't, um, didn't have a stake in the war. Uh, in, in purely economic terms, the country stopped producing manufactured goods. It could no longer uh, support its own population. Uh, it had been even uh, the agriculture sector was in really bad shape, and importing uh, about 20 million uh, tons of grain every year, uh, just from the U.S. I don't know. I don't know the overall figure. So. Uh, and, and obviously the population uh, was, uh, it was, to use a, a, a colloquial word, it was discombobulated because it didn't have any, any waypoints anymore. Uh, nothing was, uh, was what it used to be. People were uh, confronting things that were un, unknown to them, that were uh, strange, so they didn't know what to orient themselves to. And um, obviously this airing of, of opinion, last not taken as a concept, it obviously uh, came up with a lot of negative. So this was the setting in which uh, we were operating in the last uh, year and uh, three months. Um, despite that, we didn't have a feeling that uh, we were walking on the decks of, of a ship that was about to sink. We really didn't. And actually nobody did. Uh, we all know how leading uh, intelligence agencies of the world were uh, faulted in later years for not noticing it. Um, and also business went on as usual, it was like, it was mostly business as usual, uh, especially on the, on the foreign part, which was uh, my uh, area of responsibility. I was working very closely with the chief of protocol of the president and, um, and also very closely with many of his uh, advisors. Um, we had visits abroad, uh, some of which I uh, would advance, I mean, some of my colleagues did. Uh, I advanced, for example, the one to London for the first ever participation by the Soviet president of, in the G7. Uh, we had visits to Moscow, which also we, we covered uh, and worked with advanced teams. So it was, it was more or less business as usual. Um, yes, there were always uh, shortages. Yes, there was more. Um, uh, you know, more uh, complaints and grumbling on, uh, on all sides, but it did not really uh, speak of, of some, uh, some major uh, you know, train wreck ahead. Um, a, a turning point was August 1991, um, the, uh, the coup that uh, didn't happen, uh, the coup against Gorbachev. Um, it came on the heel of uh, less than three weeks after uh, President Bush's visit to Moscow in 1991, which again, I was, uh, because of my uh, US connections and uh, five years later, I was in charge of that visit and it went very well. It was a uh, huge success and, and, uh, and it, it underscored the, um, uh, the relationship that existed uh, by then. Um, so like everybody else, uh, after the visit, uh, I took my summer holidays. I went to Holland to visit with my parents and my family. And 18th of August in the morning, without even knocking, my mother uh, crashes into our bedroom saying, uh, wake up, there's been a coup in Moscow. Gorbachev is under arrest. And needless to say, it was more effective than a cold shower. And uh, I, I went down, sat in front of the television, and I sat there for exactly the, uh, the days, uh, practically the whole, excuse me, the whole week. Uh, and in hindsight, I realized that I was in, in, in a mild shock because I was 
as therapy. I was recording on a video uh, cassettes for every new show that were, came along. I still have all those new shows. And uh, obviously I was concerned. I didn't know there was nobody, uh, nobody picked that. I couldn't even get through to my boss and to colleagues in Moscow to find out what really was happening. And, um, and uh, you know, the, uh, the news said that Gorbachev was uh, with his family in Poros, his seaside uh, residence, uh, together with two of his closest aides. And I figured who those aides were, and one of them I figured out was probably Bogan, who was his chief of staff. And I think I came out of this dark uh, when uh, Gorbachev finally arrived in Moscow, came down the, the steps of that plane. In, a, in a not very fresh uh, attire with a shocked uh, Mrs. Gorbachev uh, coming down with her daughter. And uh, when it became clear that uh, the chief of staff Bolden was one of the conspirators, in hindsight, I felt fear because um, uh, Bolden was somebody that I would see three, four times a day whenever I needed to get something to Gorbachev really quickly. I was going to his office asked him for his uh, approval, and he would get the signature of the president uh, pretty much immediately. So I thought to myself, what if Bolden, uh, getting ready to fly to Poros, the Crimea, would have told me uh, that uh, I need a foot soldier, somebody to carry my bag, please come along. I would have, of course, said, yes, sir, or yes, comrade. Uh, and uh, I would have been implicated in that because I'm sure that I wouldn't have gone with him to see Gorbachev that probably stayed uh, at the landing strip. So, you know, those kinds of thoughts. And I kept calling. And uh, my, uh, my first inclination was to change my ticket. And my father, who was of a different generation, he said, are you crazy? You don't know where you're going back. Don't change the ticket for an earlier flight. Uh, he remembered Stalin times and so on. And when there was a coup, it was serious. Um, he said, you work for Gorbachev. Uh, he said, I studied with Gorbachev. They were classmates at the Moscow State University. So you're going to be picked up at the airport. Nevertheless, you know, uh, youth and, uh, and uh, enthusiasm, I did change my ticket. And the closest I could do was 25 August. So my heroism uh, was for naught because by 25th of August, everything was clear, the coup collapsed. However, it was a, a dramatic moment uh, uh, for me personally. When we got back uh, to, to work, uh, this time we, we had offices inside the Kremlin, that is when uh, it really started to sink in that something uh, was going very, very wrong. And that the feeling of the Titanic started uh, growing um, especially after uh, early November when I was uh, promoted to uh, de facto, I was called different, but it was definitely the chief of uh, the front office or, or the secretary of the president of, of the Soviet Union. Um, imagine a, a Georgian and uh, the Kremlin at the ripe old age of 33. And so I had a, a, a roommate, where there were two of us, two deputies, um, who to this day were very good friends. He is currently the Russian ambassador in Beijing, Andrei Denisov. Uh, he and I uh, both uh, you know, felt that uh, things were going south, as it were. Um, there were many, many indications. Uh, one was uh, that, uh, you know, we, we saw how some of the closest aides to Gorbachev uh, would play to his fears and animosities towards Yeltsin instead of saying, look, Paul uh, uh yes, he has the upper hand here, but uh, separate, you need to work together and so on. Uh, unfortunately, they were saying, did you hear what you know, this man said yesterday? And Gorbachev would go into a It did not help matters. Um, so the, um, the big day arrived. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I'm speaking too long, but uh, let me just try to finish quickly. Um, 25th of December, uh, there was this uh, big office next to Gorbachev's office where he, uh, where, all, where he went to make the 
resignation speech, there were cameras from uh, camera pools, rather, uh, not all cameras could fit. And in those 20 minutes, uh, I stood there uh, next to one of the central cameras. Um, I found myself standing in the same room, in the same building, in the same Kremlin, in the same city, but in a different country. Because for me, unlike my uh, ethnically Russian friends who were also in that room, their country had shrunk, yes, but um, it, they were still in their country. Uh, something, you know, pieces broke off on the periphery. For me, one of those pieces was my tiny little native land. So it was a very uh, difficult concept to wrap your brain around because I was always uh, ethnically a Georgian, still am, and always will be to my dying day. But I was also a Soviet. Uh, I worked for a federation um, uh, of which my country was a part. That was one thing, and um, it must have it must have uh, left uh, must have left such a an imprint on my face that standing next to me, uh, the president of then president of CNN International, Tom Johnson, uh, looked at me, took off his uh, CNN watch, which was not an expensive watch, but he had CNN on the dial, and he sort of handed it to me, said, that's for you. If you ever need a job, come and see me. I, I was very touched by that gesture. I never did uh, address him. So after this kind of uh, drama up there, I went down to my office, and this is what uh, Ambassador Matlock uh, writes up in his book. And I sort of, you know, slumped back into my armchair and stared uh, at the wall for a couple of hours. Um, also going through my uh, desk, um, I found a picture that was taken during an event uh, for, for children uh, during the prayer visit of President Bush, where my son uh, was uh, at the time he was uh, eight years old. I also took him there, and uh, he happened to uh, be caught in a in a picture with uh, Mrs. Gorbachev and Mrs. Uh, Bush. And so I meant to have Mrs. Gorbachev sign it, but now I wrote a typed up a, big, a quick letter to her where I remember I said. But you know, this has just happened 20 minutes ago, um, and uh, I won't recall the whole letter. But I said, uh, at this moment, this evening, I feel uh, probably closer to what uh, most Americans felt when John F. Kennedy was shot. Um, and you know, in these uh, thoughts, I was sitting, basically thinking uh, what to do next, where to go, and so on. And suddenly, um, I got a call from. Uh, a good friend across from the Moscow River from the uh, British Embassy, who said that um, they had already received a reply, uh, a, a first reaction rather, from Prime Minister Major. And how could they get this to President Gorbachev uh, soonest uh, possible way? And I said, look, if you want to do it formally, you have to wait uh, for Monday, come, uh, come deliver it, and so on. But if you want to uh, want speed is the most important thing, then Send it to me by fax, and I'll go upstairs and, uh, and report the letter. He said speed is important, so he sent me the fax. I started um, translating the letter, but uh, uh, on my way up, uh, I was on the second floor, and the president's office was on the third. And uh, when I walked in, uh, the A to B officer who was acting as his secretary uh, said that he was having uh, supper with two of his closest aides. So I said I would wait around, and I sat there, and I continued to uh, translate. And suddenly, Gorbachev came up from his uh, office and looked at me and surprised, said, "What are you doing here?" I said, "Mr. Uh, Gates, I have a first reaction uh, from Major." He, he, he said, "Come, come, come!" So he stood there, and um, uh, he uh, put his uh, hand on my arm, and I read whatever I had translated, but it wasn't a uh, whole letter. So then I continued translating from the, uh, the letter, which was very nice. Uh, the letter said that, um, you know, that uh, Norma and I uh, made the road, uh, you know, retain great friendship for you and Raisa, and we hope that your uh, experience and uh, presence will continue on the international scene, et cetera, et cetera. And at this moment, a television set that was sitting on the floor in his uh, front office suddenly started replaying his resignation speech. And his hand, he suddenly, glazed over and he started watching that. He forgot all about Major and so on. And his hand was still on my arm. 
And he was listening to his own speech. We stood there for 20 minutes with his hand there, and I felt he was, you know, emotionally, he was, he was sometimes squeezing my arm, sometimes letting go. It was real, real human drama. Uh, this is where it sank in what toll oh, it must have taken on him. Uh, the, uh, some of the aspects of that day or evening are uh, well known and are uh, part of the, uh, the public record, such as the passing of the nuclear codes. Uh, Yeltsin was supposed to come and pick them up personally, but uh, he didn't like uh, something he heard in Gorbachev's speech, so he sent the the Minister of Defense, uh, Marshal Kaprichinkov, uh, and um, uh, anyway, we basically, uh, you know, switched the lights out in the Kremlin, uh, figuratively speaking, and and left. Um, and uh, you know, I probably uh, would like to end there because the next thing uh, is already it would go into a different rubric of telling you my life story, which is not the point of this exercise. So thank you very much. I'm sorry, I think I went over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'm you very much. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David um, uh, Um Now um, we would like to move to a panel discussion. So um, if uh, each panelist could kindly re um, conclude their remarks in seven to eight minutes to allow people to make comments and questions at the end, uh, that would be very much appreciated. So um, if I could uh, ask a uh, first panel speaker, Ambassador Nishi the permanent, uh, former permanent representative of Japan to the United Nations uh, to make his remarks. Uh, my uh, relationship with the Soviet Union and uh, after that uh, was also not necessarily short time. Uh, when I uh, entered the ministry uh, around 1970, and uh, in two years or so, I uh, went to Munich, uh, not to uh, observe the Olympic Games, but uh, to uh, continue my studies at the uh, University of Munich. But uh, 1972 to 1975, and uh, just, I mean, a couple of months after, I was uh, hit by the news of Mission Massacre. Uh, you know this story. This is a very famous story and a shocking event. Uh, the festival of uh, sport and peace was uh, really blooded by terrorism. It was uh, one of the first generations of terrorism and uh, happened in the bigger city, like, uh, like uh, Munich. And two, no, three years later, uh, I was transferred to uh, East Berlin. Berlin was still divided. And uh, I was the first uh, Japanese uh, diplomat uh, in working there to establish then new embassy in East Berlin. And uh, East Berlin, uh, spy agency, Stasi, was a uh, fast kind of friend, so-called, uh, to me over there. I was just alone. And uh, almost 10 years later, uh, from 1982 to 85, I was in Moscow, uh, working as a first secretary with the embassy of Japan there. And uh, first the KGB guy who welcomed me uh, at one of the restaurants, uh, he said, hey, how are you? Welcome uh, to, I mean, uh, the center of uh, KGB. And uh, I know we have received such big uh, documents from my East German friends. And do you know, I still remember very, very vividly, you know, your file is, 33 centimeter high. That was a first a very kind greeting to me from the Soviet empire at the time. Uh, Brezhnev was aging and uh, he spoke, of course, he made a long, long speech as his predecessors, uh, almost two hours. And uh, of course, I am not expert of Russian uh, language and I couldn't follow. 
And I asked my local uh, staffs, uh, she happened to be a wonderful student, a graduate of the ESO Humboldt University there. And I asked her, how many percentages do you understand? He said, she said, don't worry, Mr. Nishida. I could understand only 30, 35%. So that was an uh, aging bridging of time. Uh, and one word for these days, uh, in my humble opinion, is stagnation. Everything was stagnant. And uh, from time to time, uh, the uh, Russian Moscovites uh, really healing kind of hope. They don't know what the hope is, but of course uh, this small hope is almost all occasions associated with Mr. Gorby, Gorbachev. Gorbachev was at the time already rising star, young generations, new possibility for Soviet Union to be revived, something like that. That was the time. And uh, in order to make breakthrough, Brezhnev wanted to hit Poland. And uh, he about to stop in between. Uh, he has uh, had no power to probably go through. And of course, uh, another issue was the uh, Cuba, no, sorry, not Cuba, Afghanistan invasion by Soviet troops. And uh, from time to time, we heard the rumors, something terrible might be happening there. My son, her son, uh, not, have not died, but the dying, tortured. Some bodies, not bodies, because they are still not dead. They are coming, return home, but without nothing. Without eyes, without ears, such, such. First, it's a very small rumor, so to speak, fake. If I borrow today's, I mean, a very popular wording, but uh, this is spreading, non-stoppable. So it is another sign of something bad is happening here. And of course, Soviet leadership and uh, intellectuals like uh, Lebatov others are uh, speaking about empire of evils under actor from Hollywood. He can't be wise enough how to manage this delicate relationship. So if Botan would be pushed, by whom? By, of course, Mr. Reagan. That was their narrative over there. And uh, next encounter was uh, when I became the director for Russian affairs. And uh, I was there. Uh, now the uh, so speaker, David Chikabai's very impressive remarks, coup against Golby. And I was just in the room of Hotel Ukraine to watch that coup. I was physically there. I still remember the sound of cannons and the fires. It was really, I really couldn't understand what is now happening, who is fighting against whom. That was just chaos. Probably this was the first time in the long history of the Soviet Union. Capital was hit by same Russians. And uh, when we are successful in inviting the first so-called democratically elected president of Russia, Mr. Edison came to Tokyo. And the uh, delegation just want to enter the entrance of Hotel Niotani in Tokyo. Then earthquake happened. 
poor Japanese like me, it was nothing. Just like this. But for Russian delegation, it was just, I mean, almost like a, a thunder. And they have to really look around. And they, they everybody looked at me uh, because I welcomed the delegation at the airport. And uh, hey, Mr. Nishida, we are okay? That was the voice of delegation. It was a really exciting trip. And uh, in my definition, it was a really one of the best trips by Russian leaders and very fruitful, amicable, friendly, and uh, very fruitful. And we produced a kid, name of which is Tokyo Declaration. I think that was a remarkable event. So I am so amazed. David, you are there. So you can still remember the earthquake. <laughs> so that was 1993. And uh, after East Berlin and after 1993, uh, in between, when I was a political director at Embassy Washington, Soviet empire collapsed. I couldn't, I couldn't believe. And of course, I did have no kind of hint or idea. Later in a couple of years, I became the director for Russia and welcoming first democratically elected president of Russia. We enjoyed very few years, peace dividend, hope and optimism, but uh, Time was very short. Two thousand one, terrorism has destroyed Twin Tower in New York. Of course, terrorism has been always there or here, but it was symbolic. Cold War was collapsed or over. Berlin Wall was uh, over. And uh, we, we thought now it's a time of hope and uh, of peace dividend. We could make war preparation into peace. Mad is gone, finally. That was the time and the terrorism. And uh, when the Japanese NGOs people were arrested, captured, and killed by Al Qaeda, I was just staying almost uh, one and a half month in the war room to, uh, to watch and to follow the event. That, that was, I can't, I can't forget. I am determined they are not human beings, they are beasts. And anti-terrorism has connected two big powers, United States and Russia, but a for short period of time. And now Russia and the United States and Japan, of course, a uh, very much witness in difficult time. And uh, I strongly hope what we have witnessed, experienced during the day, last days of Soviet Union could contribute to really rethink about our common future through UN, through bilateral, but through NGOs, whoever. But we are all uh, actors and we all are responsible. Thank you so much. I will finish here. Thank you very much, Ambassador Nishida. Um, now, without further ado, if I could invite uh, Professor Liz Howard of Georgetown University and the President of Academic, um, Academic Council on the United Nations System.
um, Lee's, please, um, Professor Howard's, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kara Hunt. And thank you, of course, Professor Hasagawa, Honor the Honorable Chikvaidza, um, USG Akashi, Ambassador Nishida, and Professor Popolsky. So delightful to be with you all here today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Um, I have three items of reflection on this time. Um, First, having lived through the, the collapse of the USSR, I'll talk a bit about that experience. I was a student studying in the USSR at the time. Um, the implications at the UN New York, I went directly after that time to work in New York. Um, and then some thoughts for the present day and our present great power transition that's probably underway. <clears throat> so first, uh, in I studied in the USSR in Leningrad, I majored in Soviet studies and the last year one could major in Soviet studies and not have it be a historical degree <laughs> um, at Columbia University. <laughs> I studied in <laughs> Leningrad in the spring of 1990. And I visited Tbilisi during that spring when the young people and I was included were pulling down statues of Lenin. It was such an exciting time and I have to say the food was amazing. Um, and then I went back after graduating. So I was studying in the Soviet Union um, starting in August of 1991. If we think about what Mr. Chigvaidza was just talking about, starting at the end of August 1991, somehow the intelligence was, was good enough to know that it was okay to send us five American students to study in graduate school um, in the Soviet Union. So I was studying Soviet constitutional law from 1991 to 1992. Uh, living in Leningrad. So living in Leningrad, uh, living in graduate student housing, housing during that time we had, of course, as, as we were just invoking, the Soviet Union was falling apart. So we had our ration coupons for all goods. And I, I absolutely spent more time standing in line um, with my ration coupons for macaroni and butter and meat and alcohol and vodka and cigarettes. I didn't, I was always exchanging my um, cigarette, my Thelonni for cigarettes with others. Um, uh, so living through this collapse of an economic system. Um, and I remember when Ukraine left, we didn't have any sugar in St. Petersburg for four months. Um, you know, is living under a command economy. So when Kazakhstan left, we didn't have any light bulbs anymore because different republics produced different things. Um, so I was living in a Soviet do dorm with Soviet students who indeed had a Soviet identity. We knew that the Cold War was over. The Cold War has, had ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. So the Cold War, that was over, we accepted that and everybody was happy about that. But I completely agree and echo what Mr. Chigvaita was just saying, that in the fall of 1991, no one, at least at my level, as the, at the student level, and, and the parents of my, my friends also, I would say, no one believed that it, the Soviet Union could possibly end. It couldn't end because there was a Soviet identity, right? People were Soviets. It, you were maybe Ukrainian and Lithuanian and Latvian and, and from Kazakhstan or something, but, but the primary identity was Soviet. So there was an identity, there was an integrated economy, there were political institutions, there were legal institutions. We were living in a legal system with legal institutions, there was no way, given the identity, the economy, the institutions, how could this thing possibly end? And then, and then it just ended. In the space of two weeks, it was breathtaking. It, and, and at the same time, nobody believed that if it ended, at least among my friends, that if it ended, that it could possibly end peacefully. And so, these two things occurred. The Soviet Union ended beyond everyone's belief. And it, all, it, didn't, it didn't end peacefully for everyone, of course. 
But for most Soviets, it ended peacefully. So from that time, um, I, I went to New York to work um, at the UN in New York uh, after this time. Um, and people used to say that uh, um, working <laughs> at UN headquarters in New York City, that around that time, the main thing that changed was that during when the Soviet Union existed, the Americans and, and, and the Soviets would walk into the room and they would take up all the air, right? There was this massive swagger and bravado. <laughs> and then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was only the Americans and they tried to be humble. And I deeply appreciate the work of, of Ambassador Matlock. Maybe not always, maybe Americans are not always successful in being humble. Um, but um, we were experiencing this time of unipolarity, right? So um, with less fear of nuclear annihilation, with democratization spreading around the world, human rights, um, many of us might have appreciated a little less hubris and a little less military force in promoting those goals. But at the same time, we also had peacekeeping taking off. And I wanted to study why peacekeeping failed. I thought after living through Somalia and Rwanda and Srebrenica, the genocide in Srebrenica, that, that peacekeeping always failed. So I went on to do my doctoral work at UC Berkeley with the same advisor as Her Excellency Sadako Ogata. Um, but we were, of course, in different generations, <laughs> um, the former, um, the late Sadako Ogata. So from that time, I wrote two, I've written two books about UN peacekeeping, and I have deep appreciation for the work of our two former SRSGs here today with us, who indeed presided over successful peacekeeping missions, right? There weren't always easy. There were lots of things that went wrong. But at the end of the day, in both Cambodia and in East Timor, we saw that the UN, peace, UN peacekeepers implemented most of their mandates. And indeed, that is how most UN peacekeeping missions end, with implementing the mandate and leaving, leaving countries um, no longer in a state of civil war. So just to, just to be brief in conclusion, <clears throat> to talk about the period we're in right now and this new great power transition. We know that two thirds of the time um, from our friends at Harvard University, two thirds of the time when we've had great power transitions in the past that they have been a time of war, that they have not been peaceful. Um, and I would argue that we are experiencing a time, we're experiencing another great tr power transition. There are all kinds of reasons why major powers are not agreeing on things. <clears throat> I, I would argue that if we want to solve the problems of climate change and pandemic disease and armed conflict, the only way, the only way to solve those problems is through cooperation. And I would say, just to conclude that we beat the odds once in our lifetimes. We had a great power transition that was largely peaceful. And now with the rise of China, my question is, can we do it again? Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Howard, for this um, personal, um, personal experience. Okay, um, if I could invite uh, Professor Veselin Popovsky, um, Vice Dean and Executive Director of the Center for Study of United Nations at the Jindal um, Global University in India. Um, Professor thank, thank you very much for this invitation and I'm happy to share my personal perspective. Was, uh, I, I was similarly to Professor Howard, I was also a student in Moscow, but prior to that, during Gorbachev times in 1983 to 1988. And during exactly 1999, I was already a junior Bulgarian diplomat, but working with the United Nations Department. So somehow my story will probably reflect very well what um, <clears throat> Lisa Howard said. Um, and uh, David Chikvadze very well um, presented the whole story. And I want to pick up something when he asked, what did it die in 1991? Uh, why did the Soviet Union collapse? And there were, as you said, many books written. But generally from my student experience at the time, we were surprised, but also it was not really a surprise. It was uh, the, the communism really didn't perform 
economically and ideologically well. So for the young student as me in Moscow, very little. And as you said, David, there was no constituency left to believe that this system will survive. In a sense, we in uh, Eastern Europe generally had no illusion that communism will ever work. And I was very curious to hear later in my life how in the West, people in America, in France, in Japan and elsewhere were very much uh, worried that they are afraid that the, the Soviet Union will be such a global aggressor that will invade and destroy the rest of the world. Being inside the Soviet Union, we felt the weakness of the system. It was both an economic collapse, low efficiency, no individual initiative, impossibility to compete in the world markets. And uh, Gorbachev was to realize that. In fact, I will argue that his disarmament proposals made in the meetings uh, in Reykjavik with Reagan and later, uh, Gorbachev plan to denuclearize or to reduce the weapons was not so much some sort of uh, global humanitarianism and willingness to achieve peace in the world, rather as a simple economic calculation that the economy, the Soviet economy will not survive if the arms race will go on. And here comes perestroika, which also David described very well, was somehow a response to that economic inefficiency. We need to get rid of the bureaucracy, otherwise our economy is not going to compete well with the rest of the world. So economic collapse, but also ideological collapse, which very much uh, was exemplified by Václav Havel, for example, who was talking about communist, in communist system, we live with the lies. Uh, why if the communist is that that we are told in the university communism is the best system, but why then we cannot travel to see the rest of the world? If our system is the best, we should be able to go and see those poor capitalists, how they starve and die there. <laughs> so Glasnost, the second policy of Gorbachev, was also an attempt to open the Soviet society, to release political prisoners, to republish some of the prohibited books by Solzhenitsyn and others. So in a sense, Perestroika and Glasnost were responses and attempts, I will call them, to prolong the life of the Soviet Union, both obviously very unsuccessful. It was probably possible to prolong, but it was an agony. It was going to die anyway. And uh, nevertheless, we present Gorbachev as a historical figure but obviously there were objective factors that led to the collapse in itself. And I would like also to add a few names here. Obviously Boris Yeltsin, uh, somehow we shouldn't forget his role here because he was the one actually who was dismissed from the Communist Party's uh, Central Committee. He was the one who actually was the kind of the victim of communism who later became the first uh, Russian president. We need definitely also to mention Eduard Shevardnadze, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. And I agree very much with David that there was already a cooperative relationship uh, between the East and the West. And not only, by the way, with the desert storm in Iraq in August 1990, but even prior to that, we had the end of the Iran-Iraq war. In 1988, we have uh, successful United Nations operations in uh, Cambodia, in Mozambique, in Namibia. So several conflicts in the last year of the Secretary General Perez de Cuellar ended because of Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, because of the new style uh, in the Soviet uh, diplomacy and the Soviet foreign policy. And uh, Obviously, we shouldn't also forget that it's not only the leaders. We can talk about Gorbachev and Yeltsin and Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and everybody else, but also the people in uh, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe played a major role. The, the, those uh, who marched the streets in Prague and Warsaw, we should mention Lech Walesa, Solidarność, uh, Václav Havel, as I already Bulgarian, Romanians, and Hungarians who express their discontent to live in a lie, as Václav Havel put it. So the, obviously, uh, 
I will say Reagan and Margaret Thatcher did help, but it was a more or less moral support from the West. It was the people in Eastern Europe who went to the streets, some of them as maybe Ambassador Nishida Dain, uh, knows in, in Eastern Germany, in Romania, some people lost their lives uh, in those days in 1989 when, when the regime fell. One interesting personal story, and I will end with that, is that when I joined the foreign ministry in 1988, uh, I was in the United Nations Department and Bulgaria at that time was very notoriously known for violation of human rights of the Turkish minority in particular. And all our delegations in New York, Geneva, Vienna faced that criticism and uh, the messages we brought home, our reports back to the foreign minister at home were that this policy of uh, violations of human rights is not going to work. We need to change. It's causa perduta, lost cause. We, we, we need to do something with that. And it was the foreign minister in Bulgaria who became the Gorbachev, who became the one who created uh, the environment to replace the diehard old communist in the Politburo in Bulgaria. So the role of the foreign ministry, the role of the diplomats at the time, I think was also essential as to uh, achieve that, that change. So it's a combination of factors, economic, ideological collapse, but also foreign pressure was important as to uh, the final end of uh, communism in Soviet Union. That's uh, what I would like to contribute. I'm happy also to participate with the question and answer sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Popovsky. So um, if I could now ask Professor Hasegawa, um, president of the Global Peace Building Association of Japan, to start uh, moderating the open discussion. Professor Hasegawa, please. OK, thank you very much, uh, Akihara-sensei. OK, we will uh, have a discussion uh, due to time constraint. Maybe we have to keep it to 30 minutes before we should end it uh, in the two hours. So uh, I will invite the people uh, who have uh, contacted me uh, that they would like to uh, speak uh, uh, very much. So uh, as well as uh, our members of the association, but may I start first with uh, Ambassador Yanagisawa, the Japanese ambassador to Malawi. Uh, if you are here, uh, please, half minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ambassador Yanagisawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Hafegawa, and good evening and good afternoon, probably, to everyone. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful discussion, and it was so informative. And uh, it reminded me of many things that happened towards the end of the 1980s and the beginning of 1990. Uh, like the President Gorbachev's visit to Beijing just one, two, two months before the Tiananmen Square massacre. And uh, the, of course, the fall of Berlin Wall and many things. But at that time, I was a kind of passive observer was, uh, of what's happening in the Soviet Union up until 1993, when my government decided to start development assistance to the former Soviet republics. And since then, I, as a part of the, the profession in the Japanese Development Cooperation Agency, I, have, I was deeply involved in the former Soviet republics, like in Central Asia and in Caucasus. So this, today's discussion was very interesting. And particularly that I noted that the, the ambassador, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Mr. Chikweizep comment about the relationship be between the Perestroika and the Glasnosti. And I think that China was closely observing what's happening in the Soviet Union and particularly the sequence of the political liberalization as well as economic liberalization. So I, I think that the Soviet uh, gave a very uh, the, uh, important lesson to China and uh, to, to which should come first. 
that's my observation. And my second observation is that oh, the Soviet Union collapsed, but I think that the Russian Federation is acting as a downsized Soviet Union in some sphere, particularly in the UN. UN. Of course, the, Russia is not as, as uh, the hostile as the Soviet Union, but still it, it's not a kind of a friendly partner sometimes, and it acts quite differently. So I think that's uh, uh, um, not, I think, but I'm um, wondering what would happen in the future in the, the cooperation of the United Nations uh, involving uh, the, those different partners like uh, Russia and China. That's my observation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, at this uh, juncture, I wonder if uh, Mr. Akashi, would you like to uh, just comment on that the presentation made by four people? To rather listen to very interesting remarks which have been made by uh, several speakers uh, based uh, on their personal experiences and uh, based on uh, Mr. Chikpaisi's highly uh, uh, interesting, insightful remarks of the last days of the uh, Soviet uh, uh, Empire. Uh, these are all quite haunting uh, experiences but uh, I think uh, we should not make uh, easy uh, comparisons uh, between different national experiences. The, although both the former Soviet Union and the present uh, uh, China are communist states trying to uh, put into practice uh, what uh, Karl Marx and uh, Engels uh, 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 said. Uh, I think uh, their actual experiences, including their foreign policy uh, between the Soviets and the Chinese, uh, are not so similar. We, uh, they defy easy comparisons. And uh, uh, there's a lot of Chineseness in Chinese communism. Uh, and as I'm sure, uh, Soviet communism uh, was uh, different from uh, uh, China's uh, actual pra practice today. So uh, they are all mixture of uh, ideology, and uh, uh, their distinct uh, historical experiences and uh, their modern uh, uh, trials and uh, eras. And so I think we should be very careful about making uh, easy comparisons. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. I, I think that's a very interesting point. Maybe I think we could uh, pursue that uh, in discussion. For example, uh, Mr. Stephen Brown, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, point of uh, a power transition. I think Professor Howard was saying that, uh, and I, I share her hope, although it, the situation is different, but the peaceful transition can take place. But but what transition? Uh, what is your views on that? Uh, Mr. Brown, uh, please, yeah. Uh, thank you, Suki. Um, yeah, I'll come to that perhaps at the end, but let me let me say something yeah, from the point of view of somebody, somebody who witnessed the first days of the post-Soviet Union firsthand rather than the last days of the old Soviet Union. Um, my, my connection to this meeting is that apart from being a, a former vice chair of ACUNS, I was a, I had a long career in the UN and David and Suki and others were my, were my colleagues there. Um, and now I've become a, a visiting uh, lecturer, mostly on the UN. Um, 
But I, the, what I really wanted to talk about was my assignment of four years from 92 to 96 in Kiev, in the, the large breakaway Republic of, of Ukraine. <clears throat> and I want to relate it to, uh, to the UN in the following manner. I was, I was there as the, the first UN representative. And of course, um, I was very much welcomed there because as, during the time of the, the Soviet Union, of course, the one international obligation which, which Ukraine was able to fulfill, thanks to Stalin, was that, that Ukraine and Belarus were also members, voting members of the, uh, of the General Assembly. So I was rather welcomed as, a, as an important connection to, to the UN. And I decided on a rather ambitious idea, which was to try to produce the first human development report in in Ukraine. And I'll explain in a moment why I think this is relevant to the old Soviet Union. What I think we all thought in the diplomatic community quite naively was that in the term, during the term of our assignments from three to five years, we would see, we would see the triple revolution of statehood, which it already had, but also uh, democracy and a market economy, <clears throat> virtually none of which, certainly not all of which have been have been fully achieved. Um, but the reason I'm, I'm talking about the human development is that, that it, it was, we were up against a very Sovietic form of intellectual thought. And I tried through many, many meetings, through, through an interpreter, of course, to try to impart the idea of human development, um, which I felt was very important and was at the time Certainly, it was a new paradigm in the UN, and probably the most important paradigm the UN has ever come up with, uh, which it, which is unfortunately uh, since forgotten. But I could not get across to the Soviet mind in my numerous encounters with academics and ministers, the idea of human development, putting the, 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 the individual at the center of attention and, um, and widening choices. I couldn't get beyond the idea of it being a form of human resource development, which of course was a very different thing. There was talk of the, the scientific approach, the part of the person that, that, are, that, that contributed to different parts of the economy. So it was, it was this quintessentially an economic concept. And I want to end with an anecdote. Um, after a long, long discussion, I felt that we'd made a breakthrough. And the minister concerned suddenly said to me, I finally understood what human development is. And he said, it's the same as pregnancy. And I realized at that point that we had, had actually made absolutely no progress at all. The, the reason I, I give you this anecdote is that, is, is that it actually, the transition was obviously not instantaneous. There was a very long and even now continuing transition in, in the sort of, in, in the intellectual, in the mind of, the, of those who had lived for three generations under, under, under the Soviet Union. And as I say, statehood was assured, but, um, but uh, the, other, the, other, the two other revolutions of, of market economy and democracy are still shaky in, in many of those, those, those successive uh, republics. Now, I'm sorry, I haven't addressed the, the point uh, you asked. Yeah. Well, I think we will come back to it. Yeah. Come back to that. Thank you. I think uh, excellent point on the human development is not the human resources development. Right. <laughs> it's very profound. Yeah. OK. OK, may I just uh, then go to our members of our association? I think uh, if uh, maybe if you can raise your hand, I can see it. Uh, would be good. Uh, how about uh, Ambassador Inomata? Just a few words, yeah. Yeah, um, okay, uh, three minutes. Yeah, okay, Please. so uh, I first uh, express my thanks to David for having helped Nagasaki people to you know, the, uh, conclude the agreement to extend the permanent exhibits of the atomic bomb bombing in Nagasaki. And I think it is now, it will continue to be installed in uh, Paris de Nation 
Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is that it's related to glasnost. That means the uh, openness or the uh, disclosure to involve non-state actors. I think no transition can take place without the support of the people. And the people has, has their own culture, way of life, without neglecting the culture of the people, no change, no transition will take place. I think this must be a lesson to any leaders in, of any country. I, I think it applies to even China. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you. I think it's very short, but very powerful message. Uh, how about that? In fact, uh, David, you mean that you said that the bureaucracy and the leaders didn't know what's coming. People knew it and that the transition took place with the support of the people. What is your views on that, uh, Mr. Chikubaize? Um, I don't think we can draw a, a line, uh, you know, clear line saying that the, the bureaucracy was not aware and the people were aware. There is no such dichotomy. Um, it is more uh, in line with what uh, Professor Howard was saying that nobody believed that it was, it was falling apart. It's just that uh, everybody had their own level and their own niche of discontent, let's put it that way. Uh, everybody was unhappy with, with pretty much everything. But um, there was no group of uh, the uh, Illuminati who, who knew what was coming, not at all, especially not the people. They were too busy trying to make ends meet, trying to stand in those lines that Professor Howard mentioned. I was one of them who was standing in line. I had a young son and I had to stand in line for, for very low quality fruit where you can find them, uh, apples, very green apples, and so on. So much so that I, at one point, uh, casually at a reception uh, in answer to a question, so how are you, David? I, I said to Ambassador Strauss in 1992 already, but uh, I said, well, I don't know. I said, I spend most of my time in store trying to get some milk. And the next thing I knew, uh, was an incredible guy, he, he sent his driver with Parmelot milk, uh, a piece of Parmelot milk. So that was the situation. People were really, you know, hurting. Uh, but um, while there may have been some uh, intellectuals, uh, there is no such clear line. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any others from the uh, association? How about uh, Ken Inoue-san? Uh, thank you very much for everybody. Um, my name is Ken Inoue. I'm a not the expert of the uh, Soviet Union or President uh, Russia, but uh, because Hasegawa-san uh, gave me a chance, I'd like to ask a very simple, maybe stupid question to the, any of the experts of the uh, Soviet Union and the Russia. That means today we talked at the factor of the fall of the Soviet Union political side and also the economic side. And the both are, of course, related. But uh, if economic system was really the problem, that means I'm always compared with the current China, although uh, Akashian said um, we cannot easily compare, but uh, in case of the uh, Chinese communism, they survived because they gave up the planned economy system to the more capitalistic or free market economy system. So if at that time, President Gorbachev tried to change the economic system itself, do you think Soviet system survived? But if that is the case, again, sorry, I, everything is as an assumption. You know, if it doesn't, then probably political system of the communism was, it's really the 
main reason. Then I can assume China will change because political system of the communism cannot survive with free even market system. So of course, Soviet Union capitalist system had a longer period, but eventually it has to be changed. So maybe Chinese, they try to survive by changing the economic system. Sooner or later, their political system has to be changed. I'm okay. sorry for that too simplified yeah. question, but my question, thank you. Yeah. Uh, how is it, uh, Professor Howard, you raise these things too? You, you lined up in the Russian uh, uh, system and with the coupons and so forth. So you lived through that, uh, uh, that the economy, economy was the key to it, the collapse, as others say. The, the I no, it wasn't just the economy. The I, I completely agree with with the honorable Chikvaida that that the ideas themselves no longer held. I mean, you know, this this old, you know, communist calibro rec reciting old lines from Lenin, nobody was buying that anymore. In contrast, I would say Xi in China, President Xi has a, a, a new political discourse, and and that political discourse holds sway over many Chinese. And if we see how, I mean, he, he um, he's limiting choice and and mobility, of course, which is probably problematic in the long run. But we've seen how quickly China has recovered from the coronavirus. It's presenting an, an example to the world of a different model of how to organize. Um, are you saying that is, are you endorsing the authoritarian approach? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> I, I would be the first to worry about the authoritarian approach. I'm, but I am saying that it is, it is, I think that system can endure. I don't think we should underestimate it. It is not as weak as the Soviet Union was. In my view, it's not as weak. Uh, and we see, I mean, we see China exporting authoritarianism in many countries around the world, most notably in Africa. Okay. Thank and through you. the Belt and Road. Yeah, all through Central Asia. On the Asia. economy, I think uh, uh, Mr. Kuroda. Uh, uh, for this opportunity, I'm very, very pleased to have uh, uh, heard from my dear colleague David and uh, with him we served under uh, USG Akashi uh, in early 1990s and I must say uh, just uh, in introduction while the process was happening in USSR uh, same thing was happening in UN as Mr. Akashi mentioned and one of which uh, point that I would like to stress is that uh, until then the humanitarian issue was uh, uh, one of the issues of the UN, but in early 1990s, uh, it really became one of the uh, important uh, aspect of the UN along with the political issues and the peacekeeping, at which time Mr. Akashi uh, headed the Department of Humanitarian Affairs. So that perestroika was taking place and it has been going on since. Uh, second, I would also like to say that uh, over 30 years, many things have changed, but uh, some have not, uh, as one can see from most recent uh, uh, conflicts in Armenia and Azerbaijan, which happened after the fall of Soviet Union. And luckily for Georgia, the David home country, I think uh, Georgia has progressed nicely, but some of the republics, former republics uh, of uh, uh, for Soviet Union, uh, in Chechnya and Dagestan, the issues are still uh, going on. So I think my question to, to David, uh, if uh, he may be able to uh, perhaps uh, go into, though it may be quite sensitive, is uh, something has changed in, 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 from Soviet Union to Russia, but something has not. And I would like to see if he could see what, what where is uh, Russia uh, uh, going uh, in this perspective? Uh, let me just also finally uh, mention that uh, 
I was a student uh, in, in, in 70s and I, I visited the uh, USSR and along with uh, French uh, communist uh, students, uh, we sang Internationale. And I'm one of those people, uh, like others who really never thought that the Soviet Union would end. So many thanks for his really uh, much insight. And uh, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, from New York. Thank you. I think because of uh, time, if there is any one person or two persons who wants to say, I think uh, Mr. Mizuno, Professor Mizuno, uh, I think you have raised your hands several times. You have, uh, let's say, one and a half yes. minutes, please. Yes, uh, I have a short question. Uh, you mentioned about the notion of empire. I think the Soviet Union had an iron grip over ethnic minorities. And the one reason why the collapse of the Soviet Union is a kind of rev revolt of the uh, Baltic Republic, the other ethnic uh, components of the Soviet Empire. With this regard, how much we can see a parallel current PRC's iron grip try to, uh, uh, how I say, uh, cracking down on um, Tibet, Uyghur, and uh, Mo even Mongolians. So in this sense, Chinese empire is also uh, iron grip control over ethnic yeah, yeah. minorities. I think that's, that, that's a very, very interesting point, yeah. Uh, could any panelist and David uh, answer to that question? In other words, uh, Chinese has the same things they, they're ignoring, ethnic identity and their claim of their own identity. Um, Ambassador Nishida, the microphone. Okay, uh, I said uh, I'm not uh, neither uh, Russia or I mean uh, the Chinese expert, but uh, one thing is very clear. Uh, I think uh, it is almost uh, irrelevant for us to compare two, I mean, a kind of uh, examples like uh, collapse of Soviet Empire or Soviet Union and now so future of emerging China. Uh, background and condition are totally different, but uh, we from the West, uh, they almost uh, look like a similar because the name of the uh, party, authoritarian systems, such, such. And they did, of course, and they do have minority issues. And, uh, but I think the Soviet Union case, their expansion uh, is uh, really almost global. Uh, therefore, I mentioned that example of Afghanistan, for example. And uh, Chinese case, as of today, uh, they are still, I mean, uh, the, uh, so uh, controlling and maintaining minorities uh, pretty uh, brutally, but uh, within border. Uh, that is, uh, in a sense, Soviet time, uh, they have been proud of kind of expansion of the uh, Soviet empire into almost every corner of the globe. And uh, why China as of today is not the case. Uh, and uh, David, you are totally right. I mean, uh, the uh, China under the Ten Pin has learned from the Soviet Union lesson and uh, Gorbi and the uh, uh, Soviet Union and the Gorbi has not learned from China under Ten Pin. And, uh, but I think uh, we thought somehow, uh, we have an illusion that Chinese Communist Party and uh, Russian Soviet Communist Party are close. No, they have been very close only when the Chinese Communist Party was born. But after that, immediately after that, since then pretty long time, Moscow and Beijing have been in more not in confrontation uh, in the first place, but they have never been happy yet. So th this, but we from the, I mean, the West, I mean, especially I mean, the Americans believe that somehow these two systems are not identical, but very similar. So therefore there are some, I mean, the kind of scholars who believe really comparison between two countries are very much negative to the future of China. Uh, I don't think that is the case. David, would you like to respond to it? Yanagisawa, uh, that uh, uh, 
the Soviet Union was an example for China not to follow. Well, China's example uh, under Deng Xiaoping, which came about uh, around 10 years before Gorbachev, actually was a, uh, an example for Gorbachev to follow, but he did not. And in the early 90s, after he was no longer president, uh, Marshall Goldman, uh, a well-known American uh, Sovietologist, was interviewing Gorbachev for his book. And he said, he asked him, he said, Mikhail Sergeyevich, in hindsight, you think you should have uh, opened up uh, as Deng Xiaoping did? And Gorbachev unfortunately said, no, I don't think I should have because the Soviet people weren't ready for opening. And, you know, uh, in reality, when you look at uh, what happened in uh, the early 90s, how capitalism just blossomed into some wild fire in, uh, in uh, the former Soviet Union, even at the end of the former Soviet Union, before it ended. One thing that probably Gorbachev should have followed to. And the other thing on, uh, on that um, sort of uh, comparative uh, analysis, I've uh, often said that the Chinese are the true Marxists as opposed to the Soviets. Because under Marxist postulate, it is the econo economic base, it is the economy that determines the ideological superstructure. So what the Chinese did at the end of the 70s, they said in a loud uh, uh, command voice, do not badmouth the, 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 the country, do not badmouth the government, do not badmouth the Communist Party. And in a loud whisper, they said, it is okay to make money, go make money and become rich. And if we trace from those uh, the late 70s, uh, how many Think about how many uh, different generations of Chinese leaders came and went. Who remembers Hua Gofeng and people like that anymore? It was like Mercedes has a new, uh, new body style every 10 years. And, and so the political side kept changing. Uh, the Soviets, unfortunately, did not heed that. Now, with regard to uh, the question by uh, Kaskoroda, it's, uh, you know, in the UN, let's not forget, I'm an international civil servant. So we don't talk about countries, we talk about problems. But um, uh, let me just say that um, I don't think the, uh, the uh, Russia today is anywhere near uh, in the interest of becoming again the Soviet Union. Uh, because the Soviet Union had two elements that the Russian uh, body politic today doesn't want to go back to. This is the party control central committee and the KGB control of, of the economy and the policy. Nobody in modern Russia wants those two elements to come back. What I would uh, say, not as a UN uh, civil servant, but as a, as a person from that former land, what is clearly visible is that the model that uh, most normal thinking, healthy minded Russians are looking at is the Russian Empire. And that is uh, what things may be going to work. And I will leave it at that sort of. Um, yeah, just, just uh, could you clarify? You, are you saying that the Russian Empire is different from the Soviet uh, dictatorship? But how about, uh, how about the Putin? What, what is he trying to? Putin is a, is a transitory figure. He will he change, he will stay, he will leave at some point. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not the, uh, the politicians and the current leaders or uh, former leaders or future leaders. Uh, let me just give you one example. Look at what, uh, look at, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, different republics. Uh, the problems Georgia had, had and still has with Ossetia and with Abkhazia, they didn't happen under Putin. They happened, Ossetia happened under Soviet rule, and Abkhazia happened under Yeltsin, the, the darling Democrat of the West. Um, and so most of these actually uh, problems occurred back then when Yeltsin was in power. Why? Is it because Yeltsin personally wanted? Because you know, there's a tendency to personalize politics 
uh, in the Western mind uh, with, when it comes to Russia and now I think with regard to China, but there are bigger and, uh, uh, and more powerful and deeper uh, forces at work. And there is a, I think a, a, a mentality, a national psyche that, that uh, is at work. That's okay. okay. Thank you. And, and one very special difference, let me just say, uh, if, if we compare a hypothetical situation, uh, Georgia or any other of the 15 republics was a constituent republic. Based, yes, maybe it was, uh, it was a fantasy, but it had the right to secede. It had its own government. It was run uh, from Moscow, but it, it was, there were these trappings. It was a separate uh, sort of country which had given part of its sovereignty to the center. Uh, today, however, if that were to return, if, if, if something unfortunate were to happen to Georgia, it would become a province again inside the Russian Empire, as it was until 1917. So that is the big difference between the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Thank you very much for your very insightful recounting, Mr. David Chikwaize. Uh, and thank you for the speakers, for your collection of your own experiences and the perspectives. Today's seminar reminded me of uh, what I was teaching to my students at the Hosei University several years ago. I explained to the students then what happened in the Soviet Union in terms of the theory of constructivism that was developed by Alexander Bent and Nicolas Onufu. They pointed out the failure of the Western realist and liberal thinkers to foresee what was coming. It is interesting to learn today in the seminar that no one, even in the Soviet Union, no one knew or expected the Soviet Union, Union to collapse. It was a combination of economic stagnation and the ideological failure that led to the breakdown and the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union system, as pointed out by Mr. David Chigweise and other speakers. Peaceful transfer of power is another point that was made at the seminar. It was a peaceful transition of power from the Soviet Union to the Russian Federation. And the international community enjoyed briefly a period of cooperation among major powers. Then there was a caution against the easy comparison between what had happened with the Soviet Union and what is happening in China today. Indeed, there are differences between the Soviet experience and the Chinese experiment that require careful analysis. Now, finishing uh, this uh, seminar, I wish to ask uh, Ms. Arbenita Sopaj to make an announcement for the forthcoming events. Ms. Arbenita, please. But to inform you about the GPAJ uh, event announcement. So the incoming seminar will be with the former foreign minister of Serbia and president of the UN General Assembly, Vuk Jeremic, that will talk about Serbia, Kosovo and the United Nations that will be held on 25th of March. Those who are interested, I have shared the link and I have shared the email contact. Further, we will have a seminar with Ambassador Kenzi Oshima that will speak in Myanmar current crisis on May 14. Those who are interested as well, they can uh, send us an email. And last but not least, I would like to 
re-inform everyone about the ACONS annual meeting that Lisa already mentioned uh, with a theme toward the fit for future UN system that will be held between uh, 24 to 25th, 26th of June, I'm sorry. And those interested or those who know uh, students or experts that might be interested, please share the information because they're the, the deadline for opening papers and panel discussion is in April, if I'm correct. So I have shared also the contacts and the uh, uh, email that you could potentially send an email. And yeah, that's all. And thank you very much for your contribution again. And 